very interesting how certain behaviors can somehow form a link in our brain. Certain things, certain people link to self-soothing, link to like safety, link to uh, relaxation. This remind me, I want to ask you, how do you think about sleep medication, melatonin, these kind of things people rely on to try to uh, sleep. I, I saw a lot of people with long, long time, uh, long history of insomnia. To them, it become a necessary stuff, necessary uh, bedtime routine, basically. I yeah. have to take this so I can sleep. Once yeah. I don't take it, some part of my brain does not feel safe. And then I just cannot fall asleep. Right. Um, I personally am, um, you know, I think that, that there are different kinds of medications for sleep. I'm not an expert on those, but I do know that um, if, if you're taking a medication that doesn't allow your brain to ever make it into REM sleep, then I'd find a different medication. Um, I think that that melatonin, if you're going to take like a natural thing, um, if you're going to do that, then pay attention to your other behaviors. What else are you taking that might actually get in the way of sleep? So um, something like, you know, a lot of people take ginkgo biloba to, for, to bring in a, alertness and awareness. Um, you can't take those things after noon if you want to be asleep by 10, because they really do stimulate the brain. Um, if you're going to take something like um, kava kava, um, it tiny little amounts is much more powerful than too much. And a lot of people try kava kava and it doesn't work for them because they think more is better when actually more is worse. And usually it takes just like a tiny, tiny amount in order to stimulate the system to go into sleep. Uh, melatonin, I think is, you know, it's our own natural system. And again, I think, I think pe most people think more is better. And I think that, that everyone's brain is unique. Uh, so whether it's a natural supplement like that, or it's a heavy duty sleeping aid, um, pay attention to throughout the day, what are you giving your body? And it's not just how much caffeine are you eating, taking, or which of course stimulates everything, or how much sugar you're taking, which of course stimulates everything and they do it differently. Okay. Um, but also how much screen time, computer time, uh, phone time, and how, you know, I'm an advocate. If you want to sleep, get off those things three hours beforehand actively engage in behaviors that stimulate your own natural system. So if you think you're going to go, 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 watch the news, which is these days, oh my gosh, distressing. It stimulates the left brain amygdala saying the world is not safe. I'm not safe. Uh, racism is everywhere. I'm not safe. Um, and, and, you know, racism is a group of cells saying that looks different from me. And so that's not safe where in the right hemisphere, it looks at people and says, I'm looking for similarities. And if you are different from me, then I'm curious about you. So I'm attracted to you, where the left brain is saying, you're different from me, you don't feel familiar, so you're not safe. So I'm going to rage against that. Okay. So every ability, every behavior we have is dependent on these brain cells and they're all running in circuits. So if I can't run my sleep circuit and I'm the first to admit that I adore sleep, I love sleep, I love talking about sleep at a neuroanatomical level, but I'm not a sleep expert. You are a sleep expert. But paying attention throughout the day, if you think you're gonna have your left brain go, 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 and then you get in bed and you wanna go to sleep and you're wide awake, well, there were some steps that you could have taken or that you can take once you are in bed. But as soon as you start fretting about and start worrying, oh my gosh, I don't have it. I'm not sleeping. I'm not going to get enough sleep. Nah, 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 nah. Then that just, you know, that whole left brain scenario. So there, but the brain is circuitry. So if I were a sleep expert and a neuroanatomist, I would probably say, 
pay very attention, very close attention to which circuits you're already be running. What behaviors are you engaging in? When I think about the brain and mental health, and part of big part of mental health is our ability to sleep, because we have to have that in order to flush out that circuitry so that we can we can function the next day without foggy brain or feeling having that low threshold for anxiety. Um, it's so important that we, we, you know, for me, it's our brain is like a tree and the leaves are our thoughts and our emotions and our behavior in the external world. And at the root of that tree are the brain cells that are resulting in those thoughts and those emotions and those behaviors. Well, we can certainly change behavior up here and we can take a medication up here but if you really want to change behavior, go to the level of the roots of a tree, right? Go to the level of those brain cells to figure out what are my choices? Yes, I have a choice. Yes, I can take a pill. My left brain, it wants that pill because it's going to give me a behavioral shift. Well, it's not. And so you might be able to quiet that left brain a bit, but what you really want to do is master getting into the right brain present moment and hooking in. It's a whole different energetic. You're expansive and open and big as the universe. And you're not just focused on that left brain circuitry, which is our stress distress circuitry. So, so I think that in our society, frankly, of course, we have medications our pharmaceutical industry is has everything we could possibly want in order to you know cure our ailment but the fact of the matter is we also have this whole brain and if we consider what does it mean to be a whole brain what is whole brain living and um, and that's why the title of this book whole brain living the anatomy of choice and the four characters that drive our life and when we really get to know each of those four characters inside of ourselves, what they feel like when they show up, who likes that character, who doesn't get along with that character, when I'm fighting with my partner, is it my character one and their two, or is it my character four come in and soothe their two? I have all of this inside of my head, and we have so much more power over what's going on inside of us than we have ever been taught. Wow. Yes, definitely. When you talk about all that, uh, make me really feel like our brain function, how these four characters really navigate and interact with each other, interact with our life. It's such an individualized thing. And similar to sleep, it's possibly different from person to person. And this self-awareness piece you are talking about, right? We all need to observe ourselves, know what we are experiencing, what our behavioral patterns are, how that impacts us. And we cannot just borrow and copy what's out there, what's, what other people are experiencing. We have to really see what it's like for ourselves and then okay. use that information to decide, okay, next step, what I should do, no matter the sleep or like you mentioned, relationship, mm -hmm. how we interact with other people, how we interact with the world. Right. right. Yeah. We are, you know, we, we are all this masterpiece and yet two of us are not alike. We're similar, but we are so different from one another. So, um, you know, why, how, how would we assume that a pill would in, have the same impact on all of us? Um, unless it's going to work at the level of our brainstem and then boom, you know, I mean, there are certain certain things that are are really going to have this the same impact on all of us. Um, so, and and I'd like to mention one other thing because you seem to be a very compassionate human being. And right now, uh, with the pandemic in the last year, the statistics are showing that forty one percent of the adult population have increased their alcohol consumption. Forty one percent. And that 14% of women, 14% of women adults would say that they have now engaged in heavy drinking. That's so we have to look at that and say, okay, uh, they're soothing their character to the emotional, 
I'm terrified of this, uh, this bug that I can't even see. I can't protect my parents. I can't protect my children. I can't really protect myself. I'm in pretty good shape or I'm not in very good shape. And I have no idea how this bug, which is invisible, is going to impact me. So my anxiety goes up. And so a lot of what our society is doing, probably because it's so prevalent on, you know, everywhere, is alcohol. And the problem with that is that alcohol, as you know, is a depressant. And so if I'm already anxious, I'm saying to myself, I want to drink because I don't want to feel the way I feel, right? Isn't that why most of us drink? And so I'm going to have some alcohol in order to use that as my coping skill, but it's a depressant. And so actually it can make the matter worse. Right. So here we are now. We're in an epidemic of drinking, which has really skyrocketed. And a lot of people can't fall asleep because of the sugar and the alcohol. Right. You know that. Or if they go to sleep, they wake up a few hours later because of the sugar content now in their brain. And they need water in order to rehydrate because it, alcohol is also a dehydrator. So, so I think a lot of it is education and how do we really help people manage what is natural for the brain? What does the brain really want? And how are we behaving in relationship to that brain in order to get it to really do what we want it to do? Yes, definitely. I think this is so important for everyone to listen and understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I totally agree. I know a lot of people use alcohol and other substances to numb mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, when they, again, similarly to what we talked about before, when they don't know how to shut down the left part of the brain or mm -hmm. the capital two, especially the feelings, Mm -hmm. They want you to rely on something to come right. to just shut it down temporarily, but right. then it possibly going to rebound even further later right. and the tolerance level going to build up. They are just going to keep on using, using, using to what point, right? right. Mm -hmm. And then it takes more and more and more because our tolerance level goes up. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I think it's you know I am I am a huge advocate for for movement and activity, and um, I love it when people wear a pedometer and they just like really actively engage consciously to get more movement in their body. Movement is so important, and I think that if we look at those kinds of behaviors that actually are good for for bringing sleep on and for wearing us down, I mean, we're 50 trillion cells. We're these beautiful molecular geniuses, and we need movement, and they know how to live a good, healthy life. So how do we create circumstances and life patterns that actually increase its our, our natural ability to have a circadian rhythm that that we respect and uh, really paying attention to your own circadian rhythm and how do you interact with it? Like if I wake up in the morning and I feel alert, how much coffee do I drink? And then do I th drink that caffeine all throughout the day? Or do I have a few cups in the morning because I enjoy it, it feels good, it's warm, it's tasty, and that's a great way to start my day, but then I cut it off, right? And how much chocolate or how much other caffeine? You know, chocolate, mm, chocolate, you know, but I, I don't do chocolate after one o'clock in the afternoon because I know if I want to be in, a, asleep by 10, I need to let that caffeine go in and out of me. I'm very respectful of what my machine is and any kind of sugar, uh, whether it's even fruit, fruit can buzz you up, you know, it's, it's even natural sugar. So, so I think, you know, if I were in a position where I was actually trying to coach people into, to healthful sleep, um, you know, I, I, there's just, you have to look at your life pattern. You have to look at your life pattern, not just what are you doing? What are you fueling that, that character one busy, busy, go, 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 or, or the emotions or fears or fear of the future or, or, you know, remorse from the past. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Now I feel bad. You know, now, now, now she won't like me, you know, all of that kind of thing in character two, but it's like, what am I doing to provide a healthy lifestyle for myself so that when I go to sleep at night, bam, I'm out.
because we need it. And we need it because, you know, that's when you, the cells, brain cells, 800 billion neurons, just the conducting cells, and then multiply that by 10 for all the glial cells in there that hold everything in position and do so many beautiful things for the environment of the brain. They're all little creatures. They eat, they create waste. They eat, they create waste. And when we go to sleep, that's when those, those uh, everything happens. The garbage cleaners come in and flush out the waste and and the microglia come in and they just start balancing everything out. And I mean, it's a society inside of your head. So, so yes, we can take sleeping medications, which as you know, work on very specific circuits and they're all very different in, in, in how they do uh, what they do. So, so I think it's a matter of really my ultimate goal would, how do I, how do I, how do I really look at my characters? How do I look at the interplay between those parts of my brain? How do I get my brain parts to go into a brain huddle and work together to figure out what do I really need to do? What's really in the way of my sleep? And it could be something as, as unusual as I'm a really strong right brain. And so I'm hyper, uh, hyper sensitive to stimulation. And if I'm, you know, in an environment where there's a, a cell thing, one of those cell towers nearby, that's a big antenna and it's like, zzz, right. And so that may be interfering with my sleep. What, what are the things in my environment that are interfering with my sleep as well as my own natural behaviors? Right. Yes. We always tell people do more physical activities. It helps with the sleep at night. But I feel like your explanation really goes deep to help people understand more. And similar to your uh, book title, The Whole Brain Living feels like our whole life is a whole body living in a way. Uh, but when you mention whether I'm a more right brain person or left brain person or which character is stronger, is there such um, um, self-assessment or some kind of evaluation people can use to know more or just it's just to uh, rely on self-observation? Well, I think that there's both. Um, it's important to know that when, when people use back in the seventies, when they were talking about the right brainers and the left brainers, okay, we know the brain's not like that, but what we do know is that the right brain, it's a right here, right now machine, and it is expansive and open and it has emotions of the present moment. And it has thinking of the present moment, which is connected to everything. And then the left brain is a time machine. It's got a past and it's got a present and a future, but it, so it thinks linearly and methodically. So it has language. It has the individual identity as ego. It defines where I begin and where I am. And it's my world. It's my rational thinking in the external world. So we know that that is true. So now you can go and you can do these tests online. And, um, and so, so for example, a simple difference is both brains are capable of learning mathematics, but a left brain understands the symbol two. It's a symbol. It's just a symbol. It has no meaning. So, but it's a two and it, we give it the meaning that it means two things, all right? So we, we learn what a two means and we learn what a three means and we say two plus three equals five. We learn that. It's an abstract language of symbolism, all right? The right brain wants you to take two cows and add that to three horses and you get to see one, two, three, four, five. It visualizes not an abstract symbol, but here's five. There's five things right there. So everything in the right brain is relative where the left brain becomes quite symbolic in, in its own way because we have language and, and a word is a word. You know, it's just a word. It has no meaning until we apply a meaning to it. So language, whether it's a mathematics language or a language of verbal verbalization or even writing, that's all very symbolic where the right brain is actually looking at, at counting things, things. So they learn differently. They think differently. They value different things, the two hemispheres. 
Um, so yeah, you can actually go online and you can take some of these tests and um, they will tell you, it will tell you what it's going to tell you is, do you learn or do, have you learned these kinds of, of things um, through uh, the mode of the right brain or through the mode of the left brain? Okay, so, so like I just said, you know, numbers versus counting creatures. And, um, and it's interesting. It, it's very interesting. And I think it's good because we're both, both of these. And at any moment in time, um, you know, if there's a thousand things going on in my brain, a thousand circuits at any moment in time, then, you know, I might have uh, some moments when I'm at work, 800 of that thousand are things going on in my left brain. And, but my right brain is still doing things, but my left then brain is then inhibiting my right brain. Or I might be out walking in nature and feeling more open and expansive and, and I'm doing, you know, 600 things in my right brain versus 400 in my left brain. So, so it's always just, you know, it's this mess. Um, and that's why, that's really why I wrote this book, because beyond right brain, left brain is right and left brain emotion, right and left brain thinking, and they do different things. And when we understand and can differentiate our lives into these four characters, everything makes so much more sense. And it's so powerful and it's so easy. And it's just like, I just feel like, like, wow, what a, what an insight and what a gift to the world. And I really believe this is why I recovered from that stroke. It was like, okay, we're going to take a neuroanatomist at Harvard. We're going to lose half her mind. She ain't going to have it for eight years. She's going to have to use everything she believes in and knows true of her right brain to rebuild those circuits in her left brain. And I had a huge hemorrhage. It's so, I mean, I'm like, you know, medicine says, oh yeah, you know, she couldn't have been that bad because look at how she is. And it's like, no, I was that bad. <laughs> here's the anatomy to show it. Um, and here's what I couldn't, couldn't do. Cause of course I had all those exams that showed I, I had nothing. I could not walk talk, read, write, recall any of my life. I was an infant. So, um, so then I had to rebuild that left brain. And what I realized was after eight years of rebuilding that character one, that rational brain came back online and said, we want to be the boss inside the head again. And all these other characters over here in my right brain who are really peaceful and happy and big as the universe and good with flow and good with relationships said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> you, we want you. We want you as a part of the team, but no, you're not going to be the boss of my head anymore. And so it became a negotiation. And then my little pain from my past, what a, what a thrill. I lost all my pain and trauma from my past. I had no recollection of any of my childhood. It was fantastically freeing. But then, you know, those cells, they got rebooted. I don't remember my pain from my past. I do cognitively, but I don't emotionally anymore. So, but I had to start that circuit over again. So I now have a character one, a character two, which I rebuilt. I have always then got shifted into really knowing who are my character three and character four. Such a, such a long, intense journey. Wow. Uh, yeah, but from that, I feel like this theory, this book, all this, you, what you talk about, I think it can benefit so many, many people. And your own experience remind me of the word cognitive plasticity that I, I want, uh, hopefully our audience listening to this, they can build hope that they can, uh, through your book, through what you talk about, they can understand the different components of how our brain works. And yeah. then... No, this can be learned, improved, and can guide like intervention or future behaviors. Exactly. A lot of time we need to know what it is and then how it works. And then we may know then what we can do. Exactly. Right? And, and you know, you're, you're exactly right. Neuroplasticity is the greatest gift of having this brain. It is our capacity to learn. And when we think about our brain, we think, oh, the brain cells, they're in a network and it's a rigid fixed network. And it's no, we create when, when our learning switch is turned on, when we're learning new information, we can grow 1.8 million new connections every second. 
every second. I mean, the brain up there, it's alive and it's interconnecting. And, and, you know, you sit down at a piano and you're looking at a piano and you don't know anything about a piano and you just start making sound on that piano and your brain listens. And then you're listening to different pitches. And then it's like, Hmm, okay. And then I can learn those pitches. And then someone teaches you how to do a scale. And then it's like, okay. And it's double handed. So it's double brained and things are learning. And we learn because those brain cells up there are making new connections saying, Oh, Oh, new learning, new learning. How exciting, how exciting. So, so the brain is always learning. So if whatever kind of trauma it's been, if it's been a, a brain trauma, it's been an emotional trauma and that character too of our past, if it's uh, some form of a PTSD, which is also mostly going to be in that character two of our left brain, it's all at the cellular level. And when we learn how to really think about our brains and create a relationship with our brains and how to shift out of certain pieces into other parts, wow, what a different life we can build for ourselves. I really look forward to read your new book. So if our audience, uh, any listeners want to buy your book, uh, find more about your book, when is it going to be released? The book is released May 11th. And, um, and right now we can do pre-order. Um, so it's on pre-order at Amazon until May 11th. And then it's still on Amazon. So it's orderable. And, um, and then for more information about me, drjilltaylor.com. Um, is the place to go. And, and I just feel, you know, I feel so fortunate to have taken the journey that I have up to this point, because this is, this is, this has the power to help any individual who really becomes invested to realize not only do I have four characters, but every person I have a relationship with has four characters. And I'm gonna start recognizing those characters in me. I'm gonna recognize those characters in other people. And I'm gonna realize that when we're not meshing together, it's because you might come in and say, hey, here's a great story. So I, I have a friend and she's a school teacher. So she goes to school. She's a powerful one. She organizes everything. She organizes her school system. She organizes her home. She's Zooming with kids. She's got kids in front of her with the pandemic going on. She's a strong one. And her husband is a strong three. And he's working from home also. And he has a good one, but he's a strong three. And she has is a strong one with a strong three. So they're in this relationship. So she can now call her husband up and say, honey, I'm coming home. And what I need is I need 30 minutes of you to be a character one with me. And if you can give me 30 minutes of character one, we can have the whole rest of the evening as character threes. And he's going, fantastic. He knows who's coming home. He knows he's what he's going to get later if he shows up as his character one. And we can actually really, the clarity of who we are at any moment in relationship with someone else is beautiful. It's, it's, it's just an amazing, it's an amazing uh, paradigm that marries our psychology and our behavior with the anatomy of the brain. And I just, I, you know, and those four characters, you'll find this a value, actually falls with the four archetypes, Jungian's four archetypes. Right. And why would they be archetypes? They're archetypes because they've been around forever and they're around forever because they're in the anatomy of our brain. Wow, well, that's just create a whole new, very effective way of communication. Right. That improves so many relationship satisfaction. I can imagine. That's the hope. I have to recommend your book to a lot of my couple therapy patients. Exactly. <laughs> They need to read the book together as a couple. And exactly. How to communicate with each other. Exactly. And you know, actually, that's what, what um, uh, I've been encouraging people to do is, is go through it with your partner or go through it with your parent. Um, and I'm hoping that we're going to have a children's book on the four characters so that we can do it with our children. Yes, that would be wonderful. Um, yeah. yeah, I and think then you can have a... You, then you can have a little kid come in and say, mommy, I'm in my two. I need your four. <laughs> or mommy, I'm in my two. I got a boo-boo. I need your one to fix it. You know, I mean, it's just like, wow, the level of clarity. 
Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Clear guidance. Yeah. So people know exactly what each other is talking about, what each other is need. The right. needs often got ignored. Right. right. Beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Jill. I learned so much from you. Really look forward to your book. Oh, I appreciate it because you, you know, you take care of people on a, a critical issues and uh, I'm grateful for that. And I'm just thankful that you're open to the material because I think it's going to help you help a lot of people. Definitely. Definitely. I even going to buy it for my clinic. So I will put it in the clinic. So all our psychologists, psychiatrists will be able to have access to it. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for watching our videos or listening to our podcast. If you like our show, please feel free to subscribe, like, and share it. If you have any questions or feedback, we would always love to hear from you. You can either email us or leave feedback on our website at mindbodygarden.com or directly under the YouTube video channel. Thank you very much for your company today and hopefully to hear from you or have you with us next time.